Time for some wild boar stew in a fireplace. <laughs> and a great red burgundy. You know, I'm gonna start right there. What What's your favorite, what's your idea of a favorite meal? Like, if you were to sit down, I, I know you cooked one in the movie, but is that, right. it, does it depend on the situation? Well, I mean, the, I cooked that octopus uh, in the movie that had chilmoli, which is the burned chili, burned, it's sort of incinerated chili paste that they make in the Yucatan. Um, that's because of what we found in the market this morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, they said, okay, we have to go to the market in the morning, film you there, and I just chose, well, you know, the things that appealed to me there, and we w went back and cooked it. That's amazing. Which is really the way to go, because uh, when you have a, s you write a menu the day before, and you're determined to do it, it, if you don't find the perfect ingredients, which are, is a lot easier now than it used to be, then you're forced to buy know, to compromise on the ingredients. Hmm. Whereas in fact, the menu should come from whatever you find in the market. Right. Because then you've got perfect ingredients and then you cook whatever you find. Hmm. Well, one of the things about the movie that really struck out for me, you know, stuck out and really stuck with me, I guess I could say, right. is that your your origin story, as it were, the, your, your root of, of what you first thought of is what influenced you to cook. That story is like something out of uh, a movie. It's at, like something on <laughs> mythology, even. Do you do you think is it really what you think it, the first thought of what cooking meant to you? Oh, I think so. I mean, I wouldn't have thought about it before until they made the movie and asked me the questions and all the questions that have been asked since about right. the movie. And looking back at it, I think it's absolutely true. You know, I mean, sitting, for instance, it was after the war in England for, uh, when we moved there in 1950. Two, I think it was. Right. And the food rationing was still on, so there wasn't a lot of food. There was no sugar, no eggs, no oranges, no mm. bananas, no nothing. Pint, nothing. There was just things like, you know, the most magnificent wild salmon you've ever seen, oh. and pheasant, and you know, rabbits, and you know, all that kind of, and fantastic fish and shellfish, because that was you. Could, they could just gather it around the coast of England, or you know, wander around the countryside and shoot it and serve it. <laughs> so that quality of ingredient, I mean, that's what I ate. So, right. um, you know, in the hotel, this empty, huge, empty dining room, there were the staff who had nothing to do. So they'd all gather around and say, okay, you want smoked salmon? Well, you have to stand up and, and carve it. I mean, they're saying this to an eight-year-old kid <laughs> because they, they, I was amused, they were amused, and right. they taught me how to s slice smoked salmon. And then at one point in another restaurant, um, you know, how to make a green salad, and the maitre right. d' gave me a lesson, because there was nobody around. It's amazing. Um, and so that was so entertaining for me. I mean, I was the center of attention mm. of this group of really sort of amazing professionals. It just happened, and it happened to be food. Oh. Well, so I'm sure that that imprinted my mind, yeah. And, and even the recreation of the film of you going down to the beach uh, yes. for, for the fisher, the fisherman. Right. I mean, that story too, it all stands out as, I mean, it would be indelible, I imagine. It, do, you, do you think if, if things had gone differently, can you imagine what you would have done instead of cooking? One of the people interviewed in the film said, well, about Chez Panisse, well, if, he hadn't, if Alice hadn't given him a job, who knows what would have happened? Well, I mean, that's like saying, what is that like saying? That's like saying, uh, however you started in TV, but if you'd been a cook instead, you know, well, how right. would it have turned out? Who the hell knows? It's always an interesting question, but... Um, I did used to cook, actually. Oh, so. you did? <laughs> oh, it's like I used to be an architect, but I wasn't good enough, so I became a cook. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it, probably, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, so then, in terms of making the film, you know, and the time it took and everything else, right. was there any points where you were like, thinking maybe it was a bad idea because it's so oh. personal. I mean, it, I would have a hard time imagining if someone did, if my life was interesting enough to make a film out of that all that stuff would be revealed. Well, you know, it, it, it's taken all this time to get anyone to want to make a film about my life. So it's a lot easier when you're my age than, you know, when early when you'd be embarrassed. Um, it's certainly easier because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, what have I got to lose in a way? Um, everyone knows I've you know, been a very bad boy, so uh, you know, <laughs> what am I going to apologize for? But I mean, seriously, um, it was a very odd process to talk about oneself f for so long, on and off for two years. Hmm. Even weirder to, s to look at yourself on, on the big screen. Um, but really, in, in all, a fascinating process. And also, I love the movie, and I love the fact that it teaches 
you know, about success, about food, right. about the history of uh, how the food and restaurant industry changed in, mm -hmm. in the United States. So, well, actually, in, all over North America and parts of the world. And do you feel like, I mean, a lot of people came forward to say, your, your influence on all that, how much influence do you think you had on, on where food went after that? Well, I know that the, there were some, some moments that I was com totally responsible for that did change. The first was at Chez Panisse um, in 1976 when I changed from French bistro to uh, American, new American food, though it wasn't called that at the time, that was right. later. Um, the, the California Regional Dinner, when I switched the menu to English, I named the farms, I named the farmers, I named mm -hmm. the supplies, we went to California Wines. Um, and, you know, we just it never looked back after that. And suddenly, I mean, the American press went, went nuts, saying, oh my God, is this the future? Which it turned out to be. Mm. And then the moment in 1983, in the Astor Mansion in Newport, we did this lunch. And we were supposed to be just the California kids, you know, keeping people's bodies alive until dinner. <laughs> um, and then again, one of those chance and chaotic moments occurred when I switched the whole thing around because the French had been so nasty to us in the kitchen. We went outside and cooked the whole meal on charcoal in front of the 100 American journalists. And at that moment was created because it happened within the next week, hmm. literally, that the food section moved from page three or four, a quarter page, to the front page. Wow. They changed the living style style section to the food section. It was a full page and it was in color. Wow. And it said, California is it, the new American cuisine. Wow. And that was, you know, blasted on every newspaper like that on the cover, uh, the food section, and that changed that. And I knew that was a tipping point. It was undeniable because suddenly everybody wanted to, you know, talk to me. And obviously the book, uh, your book has a, a big influence on, on this whole... This new one. Yes. Start the fire. You know, this is basically the text of the film The Last Magnificent. Right. And I mean, so which came first? Did you? Well, I wrote in 2002, published in 2003, it was California Dish. Right. This one, Start the Fire, which is an Anthony Bourdain imprint at Echo HarperCollins. Um, it's about 40% new material. It's completely rewritten, every word. Mm. Uh, so it's better prose than the first one, I think. Okay. I think, uh, <laughs> and because of Mario Batali and Anthony Bourdain saying it's you know the the, bi the book you should read right now, it's doing incredibly well on Amazon. Wow. Well, and speaking of Mr. Bourdain, he yeah. He, what's your relationship like? Because obviously, between the things you've done together so far, what what do you guys think of each other? <laughs> well, I th Anthony Bourdain is one of the most intelligent, uh, articulate daring guys I know. I love him. Of course, he, he's not a very bad boy anymore, but he certainly was, and so was I. Um, but, you know, the other day on, a, on the sidewalk in New York, we were leaving some studio and headed for the big black car outside, and he said, oh, by the way, careful, there's so-and-so on the, on the sidewalk. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he's a famous um, blogger, podcaster, <laughs> but uh, he's very good. And so then the door opened, we were out there, and the guy shoves the mic up in front of Tony's face and said, so what city in the world should I eat at next? And Tony, like that, said, drop acid and go to Tokyo and jumped in the car. <laughs> That's Anthony Bourdain, fantastic guy. <laughs> well, in terms of current trends and everything else, I mean, I, I have a million questions for you, but I'll limit it to right. this. I mean, you, you spoke before the interview a bit about kale and your thoughts on oh, right, kale right. and burgers and other things. What do you think about like food Instagrammers, people like that? What's your take on that? Is that is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Does well, it depend? Well, it pisses off a lot of chefs and waiters. I have to say, the Instagram <laughs> because you know interrupts the flow right. of, of you know cooking, and you have to hold food back because they have not eating. It's it's not ready. I saw recently in New York uh, a couple of months ago, somebody raised their hand to take a photograph, and it knocked a platter. And the way it hands and the lobster went flying across oh the dining God. room. It was like flopping across the carpet, you know. Come on, you know, everybody, right. calm down. It's not all about you. That's what I said in my book, Table Manners, you know, that actually 
it's only about you if there's an ambulance parked next to you, you know, <laughs> and there's nobody around to help you. Or you have a food allergy, I guess. Or you have food allergy. <laughs> then it's really about you. But almost no other time is, you know. So right. uh, get a grip on yourself hmm. and, and use those cell phones only when everyone else is doing it and enjoying themselves. Right. But look around first to see if it's going to piss anyone off. And would it be nice, too, the, the whole idea that food is communal and that you know, people are sitting down together, yeah. that maybe that needs to take importance before anything else happens. That's the point of being at the table. I mean, if it isn't, then, you know, just stand up and have cocktails. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise, very much.